Okay, I am showing that we are at the top of the hour. It's two o'clock Eastern. So let's go ahead and get started to make sure we have plenty of time to hear from our speakers as well as get all of your questions answered. So good afternoon or morning, depending on where you're at, everyone, and welcome to FASEB's webinar on Mental Health Matters, Finding Space in a University Setting. My name is Jacqueline robinson Ham. I am a science policy analyst here at FASEB, and I'm super excited to dive into this very important topic and highlight the amazing work of our two speakers. Thankfully, mental health has become a more prominent concern for academics in the past several years, and especially even more recently as we're facing this global pandemic but we still have a long way to go. And sadly, some of this uptick in concern for the mental health of academics may have come strictly from research studies that indicated that mental health of researchers really requires urgent attention at this time. And while mental health certainly is a personal journey, finding community can be key and large structural changes in your environment can be crucial. Our speakers today will highlight personal stories as well as structural changes they were able to make in their academic settings. I hope you leave this webinar today feeling valid and seen, and perhaps even energized to try to instill similar change in your department or at your university. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email once that recording is posted. Before we get started, I would like to provide this trigger warning. Topics today will include suicide and suicidal ideation, bipolar depression, and other serious mental illnesses. If this will not be safe for you, please log off and contact the National Alliance on Mental Illness hotline or text the word HOME to the crisis text line at 741-741 and speak with a trained professional. For everyone sticking with us, the most common issue with Zoom webinars relates to audio. Be sure to join the audio by clicking this button in the lower left of your controls. And from there, you can actually toggle your audio settings to test, and to test your audio and select a speaker system. If that doesn't work, know that at any time you can dial in from your phone instead of connecting to audio from your computer using this telephone number and this webinar ID. This information is also listed in your registration email should you need to access it at any time during the webinar. We will ensure that there's time for questions for our speakers after they've both presented. To ask a question, please follow the instructions that you see on your screen. You will click the Q&A button on your bottom toolbar and then type your question into that box. I will receive those questions here on my end and we'll do our best to get through all of them today. I'm very excited to introduce you to our speakers. Today we have Dr. Wendy Ingram, who's a postdoc at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, as well as the founder and executive director of Dragonfly Mental Health. And we have Kelsey Best, a PhD candidate from Vanderbilt University, who is also the current president of the Vanderbilt Graduate Student Council. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. So Wendy, if you will please take it away. Hi, um, thank you so, so very much for having me here. It's wonderful to be invited and um, specifically to be invited to share my personal story and how that relates to the uh, advocacy work that I've been doing um, for mental health within academia. Um, so it begins in 2009. Uh, 2009 for me was a fantastic year. After a whirlwind tour of four top research universities, I had chosen to do my PhD in molecular and cell biology at UC Berkeley. It was a large umbrella program with five different divisions, ranging from biochemistry to neuroscience. I was going to have 55 incoming classmates who I was relieved to discover um, were all instant friends. They were smart, so nerdy for science, and like me, had chosen Berkeley not only because of the amazing research, but also because there were so many other wonderful things to do in the Bay Area, and the other students there seemed genuinely happy. I was literally singing California songs at the top of my lungs the entire way out there in the car, driving from Arizona. When I got there, I unpacked my tiny apartment, went and got my Cal ID card, and then booked an appointment with a psychiatrist. You see, I have bipolar disorder, and depression and anxiety in my family. And during undergrad, I was showing more and more signs of having developed bipolar disorder myself. In fact, I was most certainly manic during most of my interviews. While exciting to most people, um, I didn't sleep almost at all. 
I stayed out the latest of any recruit and was still awake and alert and fresh and totally on it for my interviews um, all day. I wasn't the least bit intimidated by the faculty and spoke confidently and probably a little too enthusiastically about my undergrad research. My mind was quick and I was both intense and creative when discussing their research too. Did this work to my benefit? In some cases, clearly yes, I got into Berkeley. And in others, I'm sure no. What I was sure about was that I was excited to be at Berkeley and I needed to fortify my seawall against the inevitable crushing waves of manic and depressive episodes that I knew high stress situations can trigger with mood disorders. I had never required hospitalization or medication to resolve prior episodes, but I had been studying psychology and reading about these illnesses for over seven years already at that point. And I knew that I was about to voluntarily embark on some of the hardest six years of my life. I wanted to be prepared and seeking pro professional help was first on my list. But that wasn't all I did. I established care with the psychiatrist. I made friends with in my grad program and disclosed to those that became closest and I trusted, as well as talked to certain family members and my best friends from home. And I gave them all permission to discuss my situation with each other. And if any of them became worried, they could talk to each other and talk to me. Once I joined a lab, actually I joined two, um, I hesitated to disclose to my PIs, but one point second year, it became inevitable, unavoidable. During one of my depressive episodes, when I couldn't read more than a sentence at a time and was horribly delinquent on agreed upon deadlines for writing up a manuscript, I set up an appointment to reveal my condition to one of my mentors. Disclosing to them was terrifying, but when I did, they were incredibly supportive and really appreciated all of the preventative steps I had taken. I gave them my parents' information and permission to contact them as well if I ever fell off the map again or showed other concerning behavior. In the end, I think I did a pretty good job during grad school, but it always kind of came in waves. You'd have to ask my mentors, but based on their professional letters of recommendation that got me interviews with many prestigious labs and ultimately my Hopkins postdoc, I guess they thought I did okay. My paper from grad school was well cited and even covered by mainstream media. But the thing is, while I was in grad school, I cycled the entire time, pretty much unchecked. And it was more challenging than I can properly convey in this setting. <laughs> you might be thinking to yourself, but you had a psychiatrist. You set up a support network. You knew about the illness. What happened? You are more prepared than most. Yes. Um, but I never went back to that psychiatrist. See, one of the most horrible things about mental illness is that a lot of times the illness itself makes it challenging to get the care you need when you need it. Even when you did all the right things when you were doing okay, even when you have a, supporting, a supportive network of loving friends and family, even when ad infinitum, it's hard. I did go see a psychologist for a lengthy period of time during third and fourth year, but not for my bipolar disorder. You see, I was bullied relentlessly in one of my labs starting the day I picked my project and joined the lab. 
I developed post-traumatic stress disorder type symptoms, hypervigilance, extreme avoidance behavior, rumination, anxiety attacks, all of which worsened my mood disorder. But another one of the hardest things about mental health struggles is the fact that there is a lot of comorbidity or overlap and bi-directional influence of supposedly discrete diseases. The fact is that a lot of people experiencing, experience varying levels of anxiety, depression, stress response, and various diagnosable symptoms and disorders. And they are all playing into you, your genetics, your coping mechanisms, your knowledge, your environment, and your society. It's hard to disentangle and even harder with mental illnesses because they are almost all laden with extreme stigma that create massive barriers to seeking professional and social support. I, and honestly my psychologist, could only deal with one thing at a time. Even though everything was happening at once, all to the same person. This entire time during grad school, well into my fifth year, my personal mental health journey was just that, personal. A very select few people knew anything about my struggles and the care I was receiving, let alone my diagnosis. As you may know, bipolar disorder is one of the official severe mental illnesses. And as it turns out, I have rapid cycling bipolar one, which is according to the medical texts associated with some of the worst outcomes. But why is bipolar disorder so different from the fact that I am five foot nine or that I have asthma and allergies? My height and my immune disorders are equally influenced by biology and environment. Both asthma and bipolar disorder are episodic and treatable. Height, asthma, and bipolar disorder are all highly polygenic and developmentally dependent on environmental factors. So why are they so different? The answer is obvious. Stigma. I told as few people as possible during most of grad school because I feared their judgment, their disregard, their labeling me as broken or crazy or not smart enough or lazy. Even those that I had very good reason to believe would be supportive or understanding, including my other mentor, I didn't tell unless absolutely necessary. That was the professional thing to do, right? My fifth year in grad school changed that forever. In 2013, one of my friends and classmates died due to depression and suicide. In fact, there was a suicide at every level of just our department that year. We lost a faculty member, a postdoc, and an undergrad too. It's too difficult to describe the impact of losing someone to suicide, so I'm not going to try. As my classmates and I were trying to find our bearings and figure out how to deal with the loss of our friend and colleague, we got to talking and we discovered that despite all of us being so close in so many ways and spending so much time together, most of us were struggling. Most of us had seen counselors some of us for very long periods of time, and none of us had told each other. 
everyone kept it a secret. Everyone hid it as best they possibly could. It was because of this revelation that a group of us founded what we called the MCB Grad Network and began in our own way to try to address this toxic cloud of silence about mental health struggles, extremely common stressors in grad school, and began to dismantle the stigma around suffering from and seeking help for the most critical thing for success in graduate school, our minds. It's a pretty surreal experience at times being a mental health researcher, struggling with my own lived experience and having suffered terrible loss due to mental illness. You see, a few months after we founded the MCB Grad Network and had planned our first event aimed at giving third years a serious heads up <laughs> about what they were about to face, we prepared an introductory statement that members of the MCB Grad Network were going to present at all the faculty meetings, asking faculty to support their students attending our events and why. To this day, I viscerally remember walking down the hall to the meeting and listening to my dad on the phone tell me that my cousin was in the hospital and had barely survived a suicide attempt. I was so thankful that we had already planned to have two of us at each of the faculty meetings because there was no way I was going to be able to keep it together to deliver that message. My cousin died two years later after several more attempts. And 14 months after that, one of my closest friends and colleagues from Berkeley and one of the co-founders of the MCB Grad Network, Chris, Dr. Chris Alvaro, had died by suicide as well. After my cousin died, I fell into a deep and terrifying depression, depressive episode. But after losing Chris, I reached out to my psychiatrist colleague and got a referral to see a psych psychiatric resident at Hopkins, the third highest ranked residency program in the US. And I also joined forces with a slew of absolutely incredible graduate students at Hopkins and created another grad network. This time it was the School of Public Health mental health grad network. And over the last two years, we worked with students, faculty, wellness and mental health care staff and administrators to create some truly spectacular change. We've developed mental health literacy talks, tools for supporting trainee mental health workshops, and anti-stigma films interviewing faculty talking about their own lived experience with mental health struggles. I've delivered these at UC Berkeley, Johns Hopkins, Notre Dame, University of Arizona, and even Europe. The need is great, but my desire to make positive change is greater. Graduate students have eight times higher rates of severe depression and anxiety than the general population. Those with higher IQ report higher rates of mood disorders and are less likely to seek treatment. And mood disorders underlie 80 to 90% of all suicides. A comparison I like to make is between elite athletes and academics. The best athletes in the world train incredibly hard 
They give their all to achieve peak performance in their field. But when there's an injury, even the smallest one, the response is to address it immediately, even courtside for the, all the world to see. The response to address it is immediate. We are privileged to be able to train our minds at the highest levels as scientists and academics. Yet when our minds, the most critical instrument for our work is injured or strained, we tend to just keep doing what we're doing. This is no longer acceptable. We've now founded a nonprofit to focus on mental health in academia called Dragonfly Mental Health. We've named it and chosen the logo in honor of my friend, Chris Alvaro. While we were in grad school, they designed and tattooed this dragonfly on their wrist, which represented transformation, hope, and wisdom. For us, it'll be a constant reminder of why we are doing what we're doing. We are by academics, for academics. We're global, inclusive, and multidisciplinary. And we aim to accelerate the evidence-based research, consulting services, and create systemic change in academia for mental health. Right now we have 70 volunteers from 14 different countries, over 20 different universities, and more than 20 disciplines. And we're working together as a global consortium for academic mental health to conduct independent research, create systemic change, bring academics together through networking in Dragonfly Cafe, and deliver on-campus events and interventions. We welcome you to contact us or visit our website to learn more, invite us to your campus, or join us in networking through Dragonfly Cafe. I'm happy to uh, answer questions after the next speaker as well. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Wendy. I know those are some deeply personal, potentially painful memories and lived experiences. Certainly many of the things you touched on um, struck a chord deep with me and in my experience. So folks, like you said, um, if you have questions, feel free to drop a line in the Q&A box and we will get to those after both of the presentations. So with that being said, we will now move on to Kelsey Best and Kelsey is going to talk a little bit about the Vanderbilt Mental Health Bill of Rights and Responsibilities. So Kelsey, please take it away. I think you're muted, Kelsey. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. There we go. <laughs> there we go, got a little over eager. Um, I wanted to start by just thanking Dr. Ingram. Thank you, Wendy, for sharing your story. It, certainly resonated with me as well. And as a current graduate student, it's always so just unbelievable to hear someone else's story and try to tackle that stigma and know that we're not alone. So thank you for sharing that truly. So my name is Kelsey Best. I'm a current PhD candidate in Earth and Environmental Sciences at Vanderbilt University. I'm also the current president of our Graduate Student Council which is our student government elective um, representative body that represents the graduate students at Vanderbilt. And I'm going to follow up by just giving an example of an institutional change that the Vanderbilt Graduate Student Council was able to implement in the form of the creation of our Mental Health Bill of Rights and Responsibilities. Um, just as an example of things that students and administrators and um, academic communities can do to implement change within their communities. So just to give you some context, the creation of the Mental Health Bill of Rights and Responsibilities began in 2017. So actually my first year of graduate school at Vanderbilt, before I was even involved with the Graduate Student Council, 
there was quite a bit of distress and discontent um, around the mental health and well-being services specifically within the graduate student community. Um, there were quite a bit of concerns and misconceptions and stories that were going around about graduate student access to existing resources at the university level, which were perceived to be and, and were in a lot of ways undergraduate focused rather than paying specific attention to the graduate students. So this discontent began to arise and become very clear amongst graduate students who were finding that their needs were not being met by the University Counseling Center and the resources that existed. So in order to address this, there was a town hall for all graduate students that was held in the fall of 2017 and these challenges really came to surface. So the administration held that town hall and began to hear from the graduate students how the, the existing resources were not meeting their needs, how students were only able to get access to psychologists and psychiatrists after long waiting times. And then there were limited numbers of sessions that students could have before they were required to find outside care. Um, so a lot of personal stories came to light and this, these town halls really emphasized the importance of addressing the existing resources and improving them for graduate students. So this is the context in which the Graduate Student Council became aware of these needs and really focused on mental health as, as a, a way to advocate with the administration and seek to change the existing resources. So I'll begin by saying it was a long process. The Graduate Student Council, again, as the representative elected body representing all graduate students at Vanderbilt, took charge and spearheaded these efforts for a Mental Health Bill of Rights, which was the initial idea. The original document was modeled after documents from the Vanderbilt Medical Center associated with patients' rights. So it was rights-based language around what graduate students had the right to expect from mental health services and mental health care from the university. So that effort began with a subcommittee that was led by the Graduate Student Council and included um, about 10 graduate students from across different departments, um, really focused on having a representation from different disciplines, from the humanities and engineering, arts and science. Um, and that group developed the initial draft of the Mental Health Bill of Rights. Now that was the easy part of the process. And what came after that was countless conversations with campus stakeholders. So the Graduate Student Council was working very closely with the graduate school so that's the administrative level that oversees the, the graduate school. Um, there's a group of faculty called the Graduate Faculty Council that oversees graduate education issues that we worked with very closely, um, as well as a range of other offices all across the university and up to the chancellor level. And so at this point, let's say it's 2018, and I personally became involved with the Graduate Student Council as the Student Life Liaison. And the Student Life Liaison's role is to advocate for any improvements or any issues that might be getting in the way of a graduate student successfully and in a healthy way, safely completing their graduate degree. So as the Student Life Liaison at this point, I took over and took this under my wing and at this point there were already several iterations of the document. So to give you just a visual of what this process looked like, again it started with concerns from the broader graduate student body around the access and availability of mental health resources. 
we heard these personal stories and the urgency of improving the resources at community dialogues and a town hall. We developed the first draft with a committee of graduate students. And then really the next year and a half was building the network, building support within the university and with all of these stakeholders before we could finally launch. And so this is another, another kind of look at all of the stakeholders and the network building that we had to do through these iterations of the document. So of course we worked with students and with each draft of the Bill of Rights and Responsibilities, we would share every draft with the broader graduate student body. Within the Graduate Student Council, we would vote on that existing draft with all of our voting members before we continued forward to ensure that we were still meeting the needs of the broader graduate student body. Um, eventually, when we had close to a final draft, we decided that more inclusive is usually better. So we opened this feedback process up to the professional students. So the Vanderbilt Law School, Business School, Medical School, Nursing School, Divinity, and the likes. Um, as well as the undergraduate student body, especially when we realized that we had put so much work into this and had so many conversations that we really believed the broader university community could benefit from access to the final, the final product. As I mentioned, we had the most conversations, I would say, other than the feedback collection from students with the administration. So this was many, many meetings with a variety of deans, the provost, the chancellor. And the way we approached these meetings is we would bring it a draft of our document, but really the focus of these conversations was on meeting the mental health needs of the graduate student body. And coming at it from, from that point of view, we were able to find a lot of common ground with the administration, realizing that we, at the end of the day, had the same goals. The administration wanted to improve access to resources for graduate students as well. And I think once we were able to establish that we were coming at it from a point of wanting to see improvements rather than challenging or criticizing then that really helped us open the door. And um, I'll talk a little later about some of the other outcomes from those conversations beyond this document. Um, of course, we had to talk to the university lawyers, <laughs> which um, was not the most fun part of the conversations, but it was necessary, um, again, to have the university buy-in. And we worked very closely as well with the University Counseling Center and wellness centers to ensure, again, that ultimately we would have a document that would highlight everyone's agreement as to what graduate students and the, the wider university community could expect in terms of access to those mental health resources. So some of the key challenges that I've begun to hint at already. Um, so the original document, like I said, was strictly a mental health bill of rights document that focused on graduate student rights only. Um, one of the big evolutions of the document was including that responsibilities language as well. So it became the Mental Health Bill of Rights and Responsibilities, where the first section of the document does outline rights that graduate students and other students have around access to mental health. And then the second section is responsibilities that graduate students have as well. The, the main idea behind that was that mental health ultimately is a partnership between the individual and the resources that they access. So including language around you know, students having some responsibility in, in following up with providers, in seeking that assistance when they need it. But again, with the rights as well, that there's a safety net and it's a two-way street and a partnership. Um, some of the concerns throughout this evolution of the document, I assure you the last version looked very different from the first draft, um, was around the fact that this became a non-binding, non-legal document. And that was important to get the university to 
sit at the table with us and be able to, again, have the conversation in a way that was less confrontational and more of a partnership. So the document now really is a set of expectations. It's an agreement between the university and the students, but it's not a binding legal document. Um, a lot of those conversations, as you can imagine, stemmed from the Office of General Counsel, the lawyers at the university who were concerned about legal implications of the document, which from our point of view was missing the point of getting resources to students who needed them. We were able to navigate those challenges. And then at the end, a lot of the process was communicating the document out to the graduate student body, to the undergraduates, to the professional students, and all of these different stakeholders. So the benefits of the document as we see them are really around empowering students to understand their rights and what they can expect from their mental health care and um, promote that sense of agency. So we're hoping that this document allows students to have these conversations with their mental health care providers at the university level and point to different points within the document if they feel like their needs are not being met, if they feel like they need more assistance in a certain area, they can use that document as a tool to have those conversations with their providers. We also think it increases transparency greatly in terms of what students can expect from the care networks at Vanderbilt. Um, the initial tensions that caused the creation of this document, I think a lot of it was around, like I mentioned, some misconceptions, lack of transparency, lots of different student experiences without one standard agreement that they could point to in order to address any issues that might come up. And I think honestly the biggest contribution of this document was having the conversations with all of the stakeholders as painful as it was at times and as frustrating as it was to go through a two-year process to get this document in place it really built trust between the graduate students, between the graduate student council especially, and administ the administration. It allowed us to catalyze some other mental health resources and activities that I'll touch on later. And it's created a partnership that we still are building on today. And it solidifies that this is something that we need to work together on. And so, as I mentioned, the document was adopted by other student communities on campus, including the undergraduate student body. Right now, all of the language is completely neutral. It refers to students rather than graduate students. So the document is applicable to any student at the university. Um, and I'll talk about the new position within the graduate school, which was a graduate life coach, which also came out of these conversations and has been hugely beneficial to the graduate students. So these are some of the other improved resources that came out of those conversations around the Mental Health Bill of Rights and Responsibilities. So just around this document, um, Vanderbilt has moved to a student care network structure for their mental health resources. So this is a centralized location where all students go regardless of the challenge they're facing and then they have a provider, a care coordinator, who helps deliberately connect them to the correct resources across campus. That so might be the University Counseling Center, if that's what they need, that might be the Center for Student Wellbeing, um, a range of resources. And then that care provider really keeps track of that student throughout their time, ensures that, well, tries to ensure that students don't slip through the cracks, that students' needs are being met, and it's all in one location. And we've seen that structure seems to be really beneficial and really working pretty well. It's also cut back on some of the wait times that were a big concern. And then the graduate life coach, Stacy Satchel, who I mentioned, um, her position was created out of these conversations. So she is one person who full time talks to graduate students, works with them on challenges they might be facing, working with their mentors, meeting deadlines, being productive. Um, so she's not a trained counselor. She doesn't replace the University Counseling Center, but she's just another resource for graduate students who might 
have needs that are not, that don't require a, a trained therapist or a counselor. So we're currently advocating for several more Stacy Satchels within the university because she has been extremely busy with a lot of great uptake on her resources, which we're really pleased to see. She also has a bit of a role of a conflict manager between students and their mentors. Um, I was glad that Dr. Ingram mentioned her relationship with her mentors. We really think that's very important for mental health of graduate students. So Stacy helps students navigate some of those relationships as well. Um, so this is just an excerpt of the Mental Health Bill of Rights and Responsibilities. But what I want to draw your attention to is the, the bottom here, which highlights that this is meant to be a living document. So the idea is that if changes need to be made to this document in light of new challenges that might be coming up, um, that these conversations will continue to be had and there's a framework for including all of the stakeholders, improving on the document, and again, really using it as a conversation starter and a way to build trust and get on the same page with all of these stakeholders. And finally, um, I'll just brag a little bit, the, the Bill of Rights and Responsibilities has been highlighted in a Nature article about the future of graduate student mental health it's also been highlighted in Inside Higher Ed, a National Academies of Science panel. Um, but again, we see this as just the start. So the Graduate Student Council now is continuing to build on these efforts. We're working now on launching a university-wide mental health committee that will really look closely again at mental health needs across the university. There'll be a subcommittee of that that focuses on graduate student needs knowing that these challenges still exist and they're not going away anytime soon. But I, I hope that the moral of this is that it's a hard process. It requires a lot of conversations, a lot of buy-in with stakeholders, but it is possible to get change at the institutional level. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Kelsey. I think um, this is the second time I've heard about this, someone speak about it. And I just remain so impressed with how many stakeholders you all were able to engage and, and really to get this done. And I know that, you know, it was two plus years and, and it took a long time, but that's such a Herculean task. And I'm so glad that it exists out there as a model for hopefully other people to maybe copy. <laughs> So thank you again to both of our speakers. I just want to extend my sincere thanks. And we will now move on to our questions for the speakers portion of this webinar. So just as a reminder to ask a question, you're gonna click this Q&A button in your bottom toolbar and then type your question in the box and I'll receive those on my end and we will go through those. And if there's anything that you want to follow up on, feel free to contact me. My email's here on the screen. I have a very long name, I'm sorry, but it's jrobinsonham at faseb.org. So we have a couple of questions already, I believe. So we'll go ahead and get into that. So the first one is, as being a master's of science candidate with obsessive compulsive disorder, I know that it won't go away. Instead, I have to balance the stress. I'm surprised that universities are more engaged in competition rather than making a meaningful impact in science. How can, that's my dog, sorry. How can one avoid that stress when trying to make meaningful achievement? So if either of you have tips for, for managing stress or avoiding that stress while trying to progress, we would love to hear it. Um, I, this is Wendy. Uh, I'll, I'd be happy to uh, tackle that first. <laughs> Having a, um, chronic mental health condition myself, I completely understand and uh, agree. Um, and I think that one of the things that gets lost quite a bit is the fact that a large chunk of us um, are not only going to have episodic stress, but um, you know, have d a certain portion of us will for sure, just based on uh, general population prevalence, um, have depression, have bipolar disorder, have OCD. Um, these are, these are long-term chronic conditions. And so these are, are things that are being left behind and are absolutely not served by university principals like um, limiting your uh, counseling to six 
a year or six a you know entire career even um, like putting putting these limits putting these caps on um, access to care is is discriminatory against people who need who have long term chronic conditions and need long term support and so um, I I totally feel you on that and struggle with it myself um, and one of one of the things that um, I. I agree with you as well. The culture of science and of uh, academia is very focused on things that basically put the science and the people at odds with the, um, you know, there's a conflict of interest. So the university wants uh, to get the recruit the best researchers, but the best researchers can only do the best science and are make themselves attractive. Um, to universities if they bring in dollars. So it kind of comes down to research dollars. Um, it comes down to things that put it, you know, conflict of interests um, between student well-being, faculty well-being, uh, and especially for folks that like you and me that have chronic conditions that um, deserve to be treated like any other chronic me medical condition. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I think I don't have too much to say. I, so I have anxiety and depression, so I also completely understand where you're coming from. And I think in a lot of ways, the academic institution is ableist. It puts so much pressure on productivity above everything else, above well-being, and that's not sustainable. Um, so something I've done personally that has helped is I've found mentors who are also vocal about their own challenges, their own mental health challenges throughout their careers. And I think, again, Wendy, you sharing your story, the more we have these conversations, just chipping away at that culture as much as possible and understanding that you're not alone in struggling with this. Great, thank you. And, and while our speakers have been so brave and, and self-disclosing, I don't want to leave them hanging out to dry. So I've also been diagnosed with mid-grade clinical depression. That's something I'll deal with for the rest of my life. That's not going away. And during grad school, I had pretty severe PTSD from a situation and, and it's, it's incredibly difficult to deal with. And I just want everyone out there to know that, yeah, I seemed fine on the outside. I think Wendy and Kelsey have touched on that too. It doesn't mean you don't have friends that are also struggling. So try to find your people. Okay, so questions from the audience, moving on. Um, this one's specifically for Kelsey. Are there any, is there any accountability for PIs who don't follow the, the rules of your mental health bill rights and responsibilities? For example, if they set up meetings during um, support group meetings or aren't allowing for doctor's appointments during work from you know, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., is there anything like that? Yeah, that's such a good question. So that accountability, is a lot of what led to the formation of the graduate life coach role. So Stacy is really there to help students have those conversations with their PIs, especially where there's a disconnect, there's some kind of conflict. She'll sit down with both the PI and the student where it's appropriate or just the PI where that makes more sense and try to facilitate that. Um, if it goes beyond, you know, something that a conversation or a mediation can help, there's a grievance process within the university that kind of elevates the challenge up the line. Um, I think, so a lot of what the Graduate Student Council has been focusing on this past year, since I've been president, is around the mentorship and mentee relationship, because it's such a strange, powerful relationship for graduate students. You know, there's this power dynamic, there's so much dependency in terms of your career progression, where you go after, that it's just, it can be really fraught and it can be really difficult if that PI is not supportive, is not valuing your well-being. So we've been working on bringing more attention to that relationship. Part of that is developing programming training for mentors. I think a lot of mentors have never had any training on how to be a good mentor. Um, and that's been through the graduate school as well. We're trying to launch a survey as well that graduate students can take just to gauge the health, if you will, of those mentor-mentee relationships. And trying to 
in other ways diffuse that power imbalance. So again, finding other mentors, building a support network beyond that one person or two PIs that you might have. But yeah, it's, it's hugely important. Great, thank you. Um, this one, I think you can both address. First, this person, you know, thanks you very much and are super inspired by your actions. They've just recently started their PhD and they would like to start advocating for mental health at their university. Do you have any tips on where to start? I can say um, the, the first thing to do is to find, find your tribe, find more people, find um, others like you who think like you, who are interested in this and want to be proactive and preventative. Um, the, so find others, get organized, uh, come up with things to start with, to work on. Um, I usually in all of our work have started with like, get people in a room and just start brainstorming. And then you got to prioritize because you can really only chip away at this you know, iceberg of <laughs> uh, issues we're dealing with, personal, small, like local ones, cultural ones, systemic ones, um, one thing at a time. And so uh, organize, um, you know, brainstorm and then prioritize uh, are, the, are the best ways forward. And if you are inspired by any of the kind of specific things that I mentioned, like forming a department specific grad network that like puts on events to talk to other students, um, we have a, a kind of pro forma, like this is how we did it, what we talk about at each of the events and, you know, what we, you know, kind of a handbook, a start guide so you don't have to do it and come up with it completely on your own and iterate from there. Um, the, the nonprofit is going to um, create a whole series of these for different domains and um, types of, uh, you know, sizes of departments versus school-wide kind of efforts. So um, feel free to reach out to us too if you want more information or inspiration. And I'll just add, I'm a little biased, but I think your elective student government body can be a good place to go first. They might have some of those existing structures or ways to reach out to the broader community. I know as grad students, we're often really siloed in our labs and our departments, so that could be a way to tap into existing structures. Yeah, definitely another piece of advice. Try not to reinvent wheels. <laughs> hook, hook your wagon to whatever's already moving. <laughs> I'm also a little biased. Little wins for sure. Yeah, I'm also a little biased towards like grad student councils are similar because like Kelsey said, it, it represents a lot of people, but also those people tend to already have connections to admin and other really important stakeholders. And they may be more willing to take a meeting if you're presenting through your grad student council than just you randomly emailing them. So that can be a good place to start. Okay, great, um, moving on. So this also starts with many thanks for your talks and sharing your stories. Specifically for Kelsey uh, regarding the Bill of Mental, the Bill of Rights, how much faculty input did you seek or receive in drafting this versus admin input? They worry with graduate students that faculty mentors and advisors can often be the triggers for mental health episodes. And so how do you get more mentor involvement in, in helping students seek out the help that they may need? Yeah, that's another great question. So we, of course, had to get faculty input into this. We went through, I mentioned there's a graduate faculty council which is a group of faculty that already are very tuned in to graduate student needs and care a lot about that. So we got their input. Um, we also were very closely involved with the directors of graduate studies. So the DGSs at Vanderbilt have monthly meetings where they all get together and we had several presentations at those meetings. Um, Cause yeah, at the end of the day, if the PIs don't buy into what you're doing, that it might not actually mean much change on the ground. And I would say that the faculty, in a lot of ways, were some of the more challenging stakeholders to interact with. And we really had to build that relationship of trust. And I think at the end of the day, most faculty do want happy, healthy graduate students. And you just need to keep chipping away at it. And making your case as to why what you're pushing for will lead to happier, healthier graduate students. And 
I would, I would say part of that is not being afraid to speak the language of whoever you're interacting with. So if it's a PI, you might need to talk about what that means in terms of productivity or in terms of, you know, the lab being sustainable um, and framing it in a way that whoever you're talking to can get behind and feel good about it was a really big lesson for us as well. We also um, at Hopkins developed a workshop for faculty mentor relationship and communication specifically um, because we, you know, identified the same thing. That relationship is so important and critical. Um, and so we engaged with faculty in a way um, that was really interesting because we approached it from finding out why are they hesitating to talk to students? Why? do what what do they push back against or what are their gut responses when you say um, we'd like to provide a workshop for faculty um, and so for the why they hesitate um, the majority of them said we we don't want to be invasive i don't want to make it worse like they, they were coming from a place of uncertainty and hesitation and concern and result in an unfortunate um, negative or like, you know, often negative impact of avoidance. And so we were like, oh, well, we can, what if we gave you these skills? And they were like, but I don't want to be a counselor. I'm not trained for that. That's, that's more. So they were pushing back against the, the workshop because idea, just as you throw it out there, because they're like, that's more responsibility. That's more things I have to, I'm struggling to get by day to day. Um, you know, I don't, I, that's so much, and I was like, no, no, no. So we are going to give you the skills in this workshop to establish those boundaries. Nobody wants you to be their counselor, like literally. <laughs> um, we want you to be their mentor. <laughs> but the, the being able to have those communications, figuring out what the barriers are for all members involved, is so helpful to just be like, oh, yes, 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 yes. Here's how we're going to design it to meet your needs too. And boom, they love it. <laughs> That's amazing. That's so neat. Um, okay. Being mindful of the time, I think this will probably be our last question. There are several more that we didn't get to. So I will ask our speakers to answer those via email and I'll collect their answers and send them out to everyone who registered. So no worries about that. Um, so this last one I think will be great for both of you to talk to. Do you have any advice for how to talk to your PI about your mental health struggles? Um, <laughs> for me, the most important thing first was to deal with my self-stigma as much as possible. So um, talking myself up and truly believing that it is the same and should be treated the same as a medical illness. So for me, I, you know, fortunately have both asthma and bipolar disorder. So those, those things are like, have a lot of overlaps with um, environmental triggers, developmentally, you know, whatever, like having really weird, like you would just have to kind of address the symptoms and things change depending on where you are and what's going on and like over time and over your lifetime. And so <laughs> um, there were just a lot of things for me to hang and connect those two things on. And so I had to talk myself up into truly believing um, what I was going to say to my PI was that this is an illness I have. This is also an illness I have. I have to have, you know, different things involved. And also to, um, to kind of have a sense of what you're going to ask for. Because one of the things that is intimidating about hearing someone, like a student disclose, is from the faculty perspective, they, they want to help you, but they might kind of panic so be okay, be prepared for them to um, panic a little bit <laughs> and be like, I'm not asking you to be my counselor. I'm not asking you to, you know, ignore that. What I am asking you for is I'm telling you this because, and this is how you can help support me. Like that, 
having that thought out ahead of time a little bit will make it a lot easier for everybody involved. Um, also, talk to your counselor and your or your psychologist or your therapist about how to do that and disclose um, properly uh, to to your PI. They can be very very helpful with with helping you figure out the words and the script and whatever it is you're going to do. Yeah, I, I would say definitely talk to your counselor, talk to your therapist. Um, also, I, like I've mentioned a few times, I'm such a believer in mentors who are not your PI. So if you have a trusted mentor you want to try it out with, you know, and you feel safer with them maybe than your PI um, or talk to them about how to best talk to your PI about it. Um, I think I just kind of blurted it out at my PI and he was like, okay, let me know if you need anything from me, um, which was a nice response. But I also think, you know, do it when you feel safe, do it when you feel comfortable. Don't add pressure on yourself <laughs> with something like that. Um, and lean on, lean on other people if you need to. Great. Thank you so much. That was amazing. So again, my sincerest thanks to our wonderful speakers and then for everyone for who attended and especially all of your amazing questions. And we will get to those that we couldn't answer live. If you want to follow up with me, um, I can for sure follow up with Kelsey and Wendy on behalf of you. Feel free to email me whenever. And with that, I hope you have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time. Bye everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.